Hello, good afternoon. My name is Peter Sharoshi. I'm the director of the Rights Reporter Foundation and the editor of the Drug Reporter website. And uh, this is our live uh, video interview from the International AIDS uh, Conference in Amsterdam. And today I have two uh, guest uh, speakers. Uh, Dina, uh, who is actually living here in Amsterdam, and uh, an activist, a sex worker activist. Uh, you also work for the International Committee on the Rights of uh, Sex Workers in Europe. Uh, and uh, my other guest speaker is uh, Lucas Stevenson, who is uh, based in Glasgow in Scotland and works for the International Committee on the Rights of Sex Workers in Europe. Uh, so, uh, here at the AIDS conference, what I see is that sex worker activists are not so happy. Uh, so, it seems that you are not very satisfied how things are going. Uh, so, can you just tell me, like, why do you protest? Uh, what, what do you protest against? Because you had a big uh, march on Tuesday uh, uh, through the city. Uh, sex workers were protesting. So what, why are you protesting for? So there are, there are two narratives in this way. There is a narrative of being at the uh, International AIDS Conference and being um, a key population a defined group within the conference, yet there is almost no representation of our people within the real conference. So there are maybe two or three um, like real panels uh, in the conference has been with several se sex workers in it, but not like it was really a high uh, um, level of attendance. So we are really protesting against that because I think if you are a key population and uh, they define you to be like one of the mo mo most important groups that you should invest, then you also need to have more agenda. So this is really a lack of uh, organizing, I think, um, which is very bad when it comes to the solutions. Um, and then on the, on the other hand, what we all face is like a stigma, uh, discriminations. We have like a lot of things that have to do with policies worldwide uh, where we are criminalized. So this was one of the parts of the action that we can all globally um, affiliate with uh, so that we feel like we want to show that uh, our resilience and that we are workers, uh, that we always have been existing and that we will, even if laws worldwide are made against us. So, and, and even when people are excluding us from programs and, and uh, moments to speak. Um, yes, I think there's many issues uh, around sex work at, the, at this conference. It's my first AIDS conference and on a very basic level I'm pretty shocked by level of exclusion of sex workers. I know for lots of people they would be, why are you protesting? You know, you had a, a sex worker in the opening ceremony, there are some workshops, you have a networking zone. But if you look at the, the numbers, you know, there's around like 18,000 people participating in this conference. And there's maybe like 150 sex workers attending it. And most of them had to pay their own way to come here. There's been so few scholarships for sex workers to attend. And that really means that sex workers are just not here. Like our issues are not really being considered. And I think it's wider than the International AIDS Conference. We see that at the national level with the HIV movement. Most HIV movement, although they are said they include sex workers, although they respect sex workers as workers, etc., in comparison to other movements that completely exclude us, they will include us in a way that is so tokenistic that actually nothing is done for sex workers. And you see that globally, the rights of sex workers are being violated every day. We're not going towards more rights for sex workers, more enabling legal environment. And it's the opposite. We're seeing more criminalization from like FOSTA and SESTA in the US where online advertisement is, is, uh, is forbidden. Uh, Swedish model uh, in 10, 11 countries in Europe. And the response is so limited. All, we, all the HIV movements want to talk to us about is PrEP. Like, it's really shocking that we can have a whole session about criminalization of sex work, and the main question we're gonna be asked is about PrEP, how to increase demand for PrEP for sex workers. I'm not dismissing PrEP, it's an important tool, and sex workers who want PrEP should have access to PrEP, but at the moment, how can you talk to us about this when we're talking about criminalization of sex work? So the Netherlands has a reputation that it has a very liberal policy on sex work, but as a sex worker staying in or living in Amsterdam, are you happy with the current system, the current legislation? 
No, we're not. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, the thing is, it looks very uh, legalized, uh, so uh, you can work in a brothel, uh, you can work in a window, uh, but this is only for a very exclusive po uh, population part. This is for cisgender women, accessible. For the rest, male sex workers, trans women have no license place to work. So where are they working from? From their houses or from from the streets uh, and then uh, if you work from your house you will be evicted so it's not a good situation in the Netherlands and as long as we cannot speak about this for example at this kind of conferences I just came from a conference part where I could speak on this narrative and this and the and the room was almost empty so it really it's, it's really shocking to me that um, when you are visiting the Netherlands and you come, want to hear something about sex work, there is like maybe even a lack of interest in the in the people who are willing to attend and listening to narratives that are really important. So let's talk about the kind of other side of the story with the Swedish model you already mentioned. Can you explain us what is the Swedish model and what are the new trends? Because I've heard that it's like spreading across Europe. So, sure. so what we call the Swedish model is a model where technically, at least on paper, the sex worker is not criminalized, but the client is. It started in uh, 1999 in Sweden and it's now uh, been implemented in uh, so Sweden, Norway, Iceland, France, Republic of Ireland, Ireland, uh, I'm probably forgetting a couple, as well as in countries like Serbia and Lithuania, at least in Europe. But often what we see is that the sex workers are still criminalized. Uh, either uh, directly, like in Serbia and Lithuania, or through municipal bylaws. And when you think that the majority of sex workers in Europe are migrant sex workers, there is still like huge um, migration rates, you know, and deportation of sex workers, of migrant sex workers. And it's really problematic. We see in France recently, or in Ireland, that there's an increase of violence against sex workers, uh, increase of HIV infection as well. Because what happens is when you criminalize clients of sex workers, you don't give more power to sex workers, you don't give another choice to sex workers, you actually often take away the only livelihood option for sex workers. So sex workers have to continue selling sex, but in worse condition, with less clients, therefore it increases their poverty and it reduces their, their capacities, for example, to negotiate condoms. So we have many colleagues who now have to have unprotected sex with clients because they don't have enough clients. And if the clients say, well, it looks like I'm the only client tonight, uh, I want to fuck you for 20 euros, and it used to be 50 euros. Well, what do you say? Either you don't eat tomorrow, or you accept 20 euros for unprotected sex. And that's such a huge issue for our communities, and it's barely represented. And it, I don't think um, people really understand how serious the crisis is for sex workers in many countries. This debate on sex work is so much polarized, you know, with this radical feminist approach, which is like kind of paternalistic, and then the sex workers. Uh, so do, do you see any possibility for dialogue between these two positions or is there any possibility to build bridges? Have you had any, any positive uh, experiences with that? I think the first bridge is already that, uh, that there are a lot of uh, sex workers are female and if we are excluded by this emancipatory movements it's really weird because they say like to me for example i'm a trans woman you're not a real woman um, then you have others that are just excluded because they do sex work so i think there is already something missing if, if i mean i think we bridge quite a, quite a lot we always try and want to have collaborative governance structures but the other parties are not really willing to listen to us so then it's like screaming and a and running into a wall that actually will not uh, will not open up at any any way. So I think it is extremely important from a humanitarian um, perspective that the, the rights, the basic rights of people, of human rights, really need to be made applicable to people within the sex work uh, community. And that is a global thing that needs to change. So if we always try to bridge up to to parties, like uh, talk about our safety, talk about what we face due to laws, for example, and you are excluded by groups of people who only think like we want to fight for our own cause and we leave a whole group behind of women. It's like, I, th I think it's ridiculous. So I, we do enough effort and I really th hope that those people will um, consider and think and if not, other people need to um, lobby for for them to, to be able so that we are able to do this all together. <clears throat> well, I think well you need to have hope anyway that at least people will change their mind, and it is possible. Like 
you know, we, with ICRC, with the European Network of Sector Project, we, uh, we do lots of public events, or we try to with limited resources, and uh, we really try to change people's minds. And so we, we recently organized a big event in, uh, in Brussels, I mean recently, a couple of years ago, on specifically on migration and sex work. And we had around like eight migrant sex workers from different regions who are now working in Europe talking about their situations. And in the room you had people who come from a very, somewhere coming from like a very strong religious background. They're working for anti-trafficking organization, like religious anti-trafficking organization. And you also had women from a, feminist organization, anti-sex work. And what was really interesting is that at the end of the speech, they, they listened, they res respectfully, they asked some questions, maybe a bit less respectfully, but still, there was dialogue. And at the end of this session, the woman coming from the religious network, you know, quite fundamentalist religious network, they came and they apologized to us. They say, we've been pushing for the criminalization of client, and for the first time today, I realized that maybe we are wrong, and we did more harm than good by pushing for that. But the woman from the feminist network, hadn't changed their mind. And I think ideology can be like so deeply ingrained in people that they need to have lots of exposure and to actually really meet migrant sex workers, sex workers, trans sex workers, to listen to the, the stories of sex workers, to start changing their, their mind. But I think it's possible and it will happen. My story. Um, uh, so migrant sex workers are often labeled as hard to reach group. And today I, 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 I listened to the speech of David Melbranch and it was brilliant. And he said that don't call us hard, hard to reach just because you don't know how to reach us. And uh, what, what are your recommendations uh, to, to those services, uh, services across Europe who want to reach uh, migrant sex workers? Well, I, I think we have always proven as sex work community to have knowledge about what's going on in the field, what's going on with our colleagues. Um, so for me it's not difficult and they're, they're easily to reach. It's only that we need to have safe spaces that, are, um, that, that have money, that, have, that can organize things. This is the main thing. If we have, for example, an office where we can have people come in for information or come in for medical checkups or, you know, and if it's run by sex worker-led, uh, uh, groups, then you do have those people in because they feel secure, they're safe enough to, to step in, make appointments with you. They're not immediately, uh, if it's it's like a governmental one, because we are just afraid of everything we see when you go to the police to when you, when you want to pay your taxes, for example, the way we are stigmatized, so we don't need that. So if you really make a point where you have sex workers let... Uh, offices, for example, where people can, can come in, we can also make direct, redirect people to, for example, healthcare or uh, um, uh, social workers. But the, the, the important thing is that the people come to us and they know to find us. So um, if those organizations want to invest, they need to invest in sex worker-led groups. And then, um, and then for sure, people are no, no, no longer difficult to reach. Yeah, exactly what, what Dina was saying is that it's really proven that uh, community-led services have a better reach to, uh, in the community, uh, partly because sex workers know each other, they know where we work, you know, in different work settings as well. And uh, there's been like really some good examples of organizations, for example, uh, Accept ST in France, which is a migrant trans sex worker organization. And they focus not just on sex work, but on issues relating to like uh, access to documentation, you know, HIV services, etc. And they really have a strong network of women, trans women, a lot of them from, uh, from Latin America, but also from Asia or other part of the world, and uh, who are able to access services there. And I think even if the organization is not fully led by sex workers, you need to hire peer, like members of the community, to do outreach, to do services. For example, you know, many uh, Romanian women work in the sex industry in, uh, in Western Europe and they need to be able to access services, so you need to provide information in Romanian. And even better, if the person who goes in the street giving uh, flyers or condoms, etc., is a Romanian herself, a Romanian sex worker herself. And I think this is really possible. I mean, it's proven, it's documented in the sex worker implementation tool, it's recommendation from WHO and the UNAIDS, but at the national level, often what we see is that it's not implemented. There's barely any funding for sex workers' programs, sex worker-led programs, and that needs to change. What about the uh, LGBTQ communities? Is, is the sex work addressed appro appropriately in that communities? How do you feel about that? Well, I work uh, pre pretty cross-referenced, uh, uh, so I'm also uh, co-chair of TGU. 
and I just recently stepped in that position and I see that, for example, within TGU there is no uh, agenda on sex work. So uh, there is an agenda, but they made researches and did things, but there's no position. So there's not a, 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 a board member dedicated with a task for Europe on sex work. So this is already where it lacks. We need to focus us within our communities, LGBT, um, as well on this uh, agenda. It's, it's major important because as you see from here, it's a key population that can, that can go into all kinds of things. And it, as long as there's this stigma about sex work uh, within our LGBT community, that we do not dare to speak up, that we do exist within our communities, that it's a part of LGBT identity even, um, then uh, it will not go uh, come to the better. So it's really important that we start to change our movements and be more open and transparent and include groups that are left behind. Yeah, I think that's definitely one of the big issues for the, the European network as well is to see how, uh, how to challenge LGBT movement. I think definitely the LGBT movement in Europe but globally has failed trans people and sex workers. Like you have to, remem to remember that uh, you know, the, the Stonewall riots were started by trans women, many of them sex workers, many of them trans women of color. And now the LGBT movement has, or LGB movement have changed so much that like, it's really led by like, white cis men who have no solidarity for trans women, for migrants and sex workers. The whole agenda has been around like, marriage equality, which is very important. And thank you very much for activists who fought for marriage equality. I'm happily married and thanks for them for fighting for that. But at the same time, this has been done on, uh, by excluding trans women, trans people and sex workers. We're seeing some change. So with, uh, with ICRC, the European network, we've been working with Transgender Europe, more recently with uh, ILGA Europe, the main LGBT network, who now both networks, trans and LGBT, have a position on, on sex work, supporting decriminalization but it really took lots of time and resources and energy to arrive to this situation. So what we want to see is for all LGBT organizations in Europe and globally to take a position on sex work, to include sex workers, LGBT sex workers, and to really actively engage with sex workers. And we often say like always, you know, like, but also like trans organization, we see some trans organization excluding trans sex workers in this kind of quest for respectability. It's like, oh, now we're fighting for laws to be respected as trans people. So we can't really have a position on sex work because, you know, we might have a fight with feminist abolitionists that we need, like, support in Parliament. And it's not just theoretical. I see that in many countries in Europe where the trans organization, the main trans organization, as they become more professionalized, exclude trans sex workers. And that also is very problematic and hopefully will change. Uh, were there any, like, uh, inspiring experience here at the conference for you or message you will take back from this conference? Anything to highlight? Well, for me, it was very uh, special, of course, to do the opening ceremony. But on the other hand, what I also said, I don't want to be here as a window dressing um, and uh, as a token. So for my community, and that's why I speak up in every session that I'm invited, that actually um, we are really excluded from the, from the discourse. And, and as well, like if we look at the future of this, of this um, International AIDS Conference, the next one will be held in San Francisco. In San Francisco, sex workers cannot enter, Muslim people cannot enter, drug use people cannot enter, so you have a whole group of people that you immediately exclude from this conference to be present and to talk about the, their establishments or uh, what they have achieved within, the, within those years. And it's extremely uh, problematic, I think. Um, so. Again, um, this is one of the things that make me deeply saddened to see that this is like something that we all the time as sex workers have to address over and over again to fight for our rights, but as well to fight for our own uh, issues such as HIV. So, I mean, I think this is really staggering and I'm, I'm hoping that we as, uh, as a community can step up and really tell that narrative that if you exclude people from conferences that are so important for the well-being of our communities, uh, you're really not doing a good job. I think one uh, exciting moment that happened for me was the, the, the trans sex worker workshop. So we organized between the, the sex worker networking zone and the trans sex working zone a workshop led by trans sex workers. And I think that was the only one that was specifically by and for trans sex workers. And it's a crucial issue. I think if we talk about the LGBT movement, but if the Asian movement, LGBT movement, feminist movement exclude trans sex workers, they are really failing in their task. Like as you might know 
You know, in the last few years, around like 1,500 trans uh, people were murdered, and uh, the vast majority, 65% of them, were sex workers. You cannot have a uh, LGBT movement or HIV movement that ignore the issue of violence against trans women, trans sex workers. So it was really exciting to be part of like uh, organizing this workshop. And, and this morning was a lot of fun to interrupt the, the flame of inclusion. Uh, that's a new tradition for the AIDS conference. They have this flame of inclusion that goes from one city to the other. So it was lit up this morning in Amsterdam and it's going to make its way to uh, San Francisco. And it's unbelievable that they don't see the irony of calling this the flame of inclusion, it, where the next, sex worker conference, uh, the next uh, AIDS conference is going to be in San Francisco, but, you know, that still has a ban of drug users on sex workers. The Muslim ban as well, I mean, it's pretty shocking that, you know, especially coming from Amsterdam, that really has an issue with racism, you know, with the, the increase of like Islamophobia and racism in, in Europe, you know, from Hungary to Amsterdam to France to the UK, that people can still talk about having a conference in, in, in Trump America where there is a Muslim ban and a ban on many key population. And the fact that this is not on the agenda of the majority of the conference, who seems to be very happy to be able to have a you know, week paid by the organ HIV organization in San Francisco is really saddening, really. I think every single person here should realize what it means for this key population and Muslim people, like people from these Muslim countries which are banned, that the next conference is in San Francisco. And it, shouldn't, it really shouldn't happen there. Thank you so much, Dina and Luca, to, for being here. And uh, I wish you luck for your work. It's truly important. Thank you very much. Thank you, very Thank much. you for those who were watching us. Thank you.